Good afternoon and welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just one minute. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Oceana's Ocean Steward Spotlight Series. We're going to be highlighting ocean stewards from diverse backgrounds, connecting more ocean lovers with stories that might be important and inspiring to you. June is also World Oceans Month, and starting next week, we're heading into Plastic Free July. So excellent timing to be touching on both the plastic pollution crisis and how it impacts our oceans. My name is Nancy Downs. I'm the full-time field representative in Massachusetts for Oceana. And I'd like to welcome our special guest speaker today, Jackie Nunez. Jackie's the founder of The Last Plastic Straw, the advocacy program manager with Plastic Pollution Coalition, kayak guide, gardener, instigator, activist, traveler, world citizen, and coming in live from Puerto Rico today. Jackie, I want to jump right in and ask you, can you tell us about that defining moment where and when you fell in love with the ocean? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Nancy. I'm, I'm stoked to be here. Um, yeah, I think my, my first moment with the ocean must have been California. We moved when I, I was born in Illinois. I think I was two years old when we moved to California. We lived in Anaheim. But I have to say, I don't remember the exact uh, moment, but my parents like to say when I first saw the ocean, I was horrified, which I was kind of <laughs> bummed about. But I think it was the way they said the waves, whatever. I was just like mortified, like I do not want that. Inconsolable, actually. And, um, and so that was really kind of eye-opening me, to me because I love the water and I love the ocean now. And I just remember my parents, you know, bringing us to the ocean and us playing for hours. I come from a big family, so there's five of us. And so we just always played in the water. And, you know, um, before, before people started doing these inclusive vacations with stuff for kids to do, we was just, at least we had five of us, but we would just always play at the pool or whatever, whenever we traveled. So, um, yeah, I'd have to say California was when I first fell in love with that. Nice. And from, that. and from that moment, from that connection mm -hmm. and then connecting the dots, I heard that river kayak guide, you know, mm -hmm. how did that lead you to getting more involved in the fight against plastic pollution? Can you take us on that journey? On that journey. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I was a, actually a river raft guide, not a kayak guide, but um, I also am a, a kayak guide for ocean kayaks. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I call myself a self-proclaimed slacktivist turned activist. I mean, I voted, but I barely voted. And, um, you know, I really wanted to keep politics to politicians that they thought they really didn't care about the environment. And I just loved being outside and showing people, you know, natural spaces. And, um, and to me, that was really what I love to do and like to do. Um, my journey is, I actually, I didn't share this with you, but I used to, I coming out of college, I got a degree and my first degree was in, in health and fitness in early nineties. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, it was between uh, Peace Corps and, and Club Med. And uh, <laughs> I, I picked Club Med. And, um, and at the time it was kind of weird politics with Reagan and everything. And people club and uh, Peace Corps were saying, it's kind of a weird time to be going and representing the government because they're asking us to do really weird things that really don't serve the community. So I was like, all right, club med. So I worked in the water with kids all the time. And so I could see the impacts that our, our own little resort was having, but also just exponentially over the years, but really didn't do much. You know, I traveled a lot and, um, uh, didn't really do much until, that moment where uh, I went to Belize and what well, okay backtrack I went I, I moved to Santa Cruz so that was it that was my eye-opening um I, I started volunteering for Save Our Shores a local organization there and, and started learning about the problem more and just involving beach cleanups but really you know kind of not doing much and until I, I took a, a, a kayak trip um with a bunch of women to um Belize and we were in at Glover's Atoll which is 45 um, miles off Oh, kilometers off the coast of Belize and we were literally in huts in the water and it's a it's a world heritage site they don't even fish there mm -hmm. and so it's the most amazing just living coral and big groupers coming up to you because they're not used to being you know fish were curious and super cool you know time and um but a storm came through one night and we literally thought it, our our hut was going to blow in the water I mean we oh had we had water we had waves coming up through our floorboards we were holding the the, the doors I mean, it was just blowing and everything was crazy lightning and thunder everywhere um but the next day we're out in these beautiful places um doing some some wall dives and everything and a, a literally a river of trash came by us mm -hmm. and most of it was plastic and identifiable 
packaging and things that people use every day. Sure. And, um, and that was it. That was really when I just was like, I got to do more, you know, and, I need to. That atoll is pretty remote, right? So it's pretty far away from. Yeah. 45 kilometers off the coast of Belize. So, you know, what it happened, like the storms just, you know, flushed out the mainland off of the waterways and, and sure. all that trash came. And so there it was out there. And so I got back to Santa Cruz, I was super dejected and, um, and already been volunteering for Save Our Shores and Beach Cleaners. And I already started saying no, no to plastic straws because I was seeing what we were cleaning up. And I thought, well, this is one thing I can do, you know? Sure. Um, but I had the aha moment when I went to a restaurant and I was waiting for some friends to come from out of town and I was overlooking the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. And I got a glass of water with a straw in it. And I had already been kind of on high alert. I, I don't really drink much Smith drinks or anything, but I know to ask for no straw with a, a drink. But I didn't think my water would come with it. And when it came with that, that was it. That was my last plastic straw moment. Like I right. was looking out there, I saw this. And at the time we had the drought going on in um, uh, California. And so for those of you from California, you know, we had this Water's Precious campaign, which basically asked restaurants to serve water upon request. And, mm -hmm. and that was it. That was my aha moment. I'm like, that's it. The least someone can do is, is, is serve water upon request. We're not asking restaurants to do anything or change anything. I've worked in the service industry a lot. And yeah. my brother owns a restaurant and I knew that this would be an easy type of ask. And I knew about people that the no ask was better than the ask that if you, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the restaurant industry, that's how you upsell, right? You're, you're kind of offering something. And, you, and you probably hadn't asked for that straw, right? It just came. No, it just came. Right. So, um, so that was it. And that's when I had the idea of, about doing that. So I approached Save Our Shores at the time and I said, Hey, I had this idea. And we actually owed Save Our Shores 50 hours of volunteer time because I took their sanctuary steward training. I'm like, can this be my project? Can this be my 50 hours? And they said, sure, but this sounds great, but we don't have money to pay. I'm like, that's fine. I don't want to, you know, I just want to do this. And so one of the great things I did was to reach out to our our city first. Um, and we have a, um, believe it or not, it, not, not all cities have this, but we have a waste reduction manager that's really kind of involved in all this stuff. And I went to our waste reduction manager and she was key. You know, she was key. She told me we'd already gone through the polystyrene ban. And she goes, you can't show up at restaurants and be handed. You have to show alternatives. And, and also my segue was upon request first and foremost, because alternatives are always more expensive. But if you're, if you're serving 90% less plastic straws, which is what happens when you don't give it out automatically, yep. the people who need them are going to ask for them, but that's it. You know, it's a really small percentage. So that's how it all kind of came about. I, I was kind of known as the crazy straw lady and I saw the mm -hmm. reaction of my friends, but we'd do a beach cleanup, people who were like considered environmentalists, but yeah, we'd go out for a drink or a burrito or whatever. And they're like sucking on straws. I'm like, did you not just see what we picked up? And it was a little disconnect, you know, that was literally in front of our noses and no one was taking stock of it. And I could see right. just how far removed we were. So my whole intention was that no one sets out to pollute the planet with just not aware. And to have this be this, this entryway, this, this, um, I call it the, the gateway issue to the bit broader problem about plastic pollution, single use in particular. So that was, that was my mission statement. It had nothing to do with straws, actually. It was raising awareness about the absurdity of single use plastic. It affects on our environment, our health, and to eliminate, right. um, single use plastic from the source. But I see that simplicity of that single item and it's right in front of your face and you didn't ask for it, but you can actually do something simple about that one little item and then apply that, like you said, the gateway item to all these other things that we don't really need that we just need to stop and think about. Yeah. And, and you know, it didn't stop there. That was the thing. I saw people like their head was going like that was like a, a light bulb that went off and they start looking around like, what else am I doing? That single use water bottle, whatever. And they start to be aware. And so you could see this you know, this intention and it grows in people and they became a lot more aware. And I knew I could see it with my friends. I can even see it with restaurants. If the least they could do is just write straws upon request mm -hmm. and then open their eyes like, oh my God, like what else are we doing that we're wasting like this? Because yeah. for restaurants, it's a, it's a small margin. And so anything they can trim the fat and not be spending so much money. So that was huge. And you mentioned that the drought and water on request. And right about that same time in 2015, a video came out that also blew everything out of the out Actually, of the that water. was a long four years after. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. So me, just me going around, you know, not, yeah, just on my, on my own time and dime, going around restaurants, telling my friends, embarrassing my friends, you know, asking them not to, um, it's a mosquito, Puerto Rico, um, <laughs> uh, ask my friends, you know, not to, uh, you know, order straws and I always have my pencil case of straws and reusables and stuff. So it was four long years of that. And then, yeah. um, 
but I started a Facebook page. I had, had a website by then. And then, yes, the infamous turtle video happened in the fall of actually August of 2015. And that just blew it all up. I called that was the last plastic straw moment for the masses. I call it the, mm -hmm. the straw felt around the world. And mm -hmm. Christine Finnegar, the... For for folks who yeah. so for folks who may not have and so for those who are watching and are new to this issue in, in 2015 a video came out with a turtle that had a piece of plastic in its nose and unfortunately as uh people that were trying to assist the turtle began um, pulling it out of the turtle's nose most people were horrified to see that it was a very long uh plastic straw it was significantly large and it just touched i think it touched people with shock and awe and disbelief that this is an item like it made that connection to this is what my action on land is doing to these creatures in the marine environment so go ahead yeah. i you know yeah i mean we call like the 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 the, the turtles like the poster child of the movement right because they they ingest so much plastic that now it's i think unfortunately 100 percent of the turtles that they do not not crop season there's some sort of plastic in their yeah. stomachs um but yeah and and um yeah, it was eight excruciating minutes of them uh pulling the um the the straw out of the turtle's nose yeah. and so this is this was really what it, it took and 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 people were like just horrified like that was their last plastic straw moment so they they just had to you know sure yeah do it and you also mentioned um you know your family and um network spans sure. into puerto rico as well and so yeah. over a long period of time um, you were seeing changes in Puerto Rico um, and mm -hmm. getting a snapshot of change there um, and having yeah. this sense or a duty to act knowing what it was 30 years ago versus how things are today. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your experience in Puerto Rico and also that intersection with the Latino community. Mm -hmm. And if you're seeing opportunities or obstacles uh, in communicating both what you know here in the United States and how does that translate in Puerto Rico and any work that you've been doing in the Latino community. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've, I've been, I've got this great snapshot because I uh, was fortunate enough to spend three years here, uh, my junior high school years from seventh to ninth grade. And I went to a, a little school here called Rainy School. It's an old Air Force base that became a Coast Guard base at the time mm -hmm. when I was going to school here. My dad got a job in computers and they had an in my dad's my parents are cuban so he's he's bilingual and they uh gave me the opportunity to come here for three years so we loved it and this northwest side of the island it's just like we could you know we we just ran all around and we can had access to the beach and so i have this snapshot from when i was here and then um now i have extended family my, my partner's from here and family's here so i come back to the same area this is where they grew up mm -hmm. and um and so I see these beaches and I could see exponentially the amount of trash that's, that's coming from the plastic trash that's sure. coming on the shores. And so as far as translation of it, um, believe it or not, when I first started, this is an interesting story. When I first started The Last Plastic Straw, I thought, well, let, let me translate some of my information, you know, and oh, I'll, mm. I'll start with Spanish. Not that I'm, I'm not, I'm actually a sad excuse for a Cuban, Cuban American. I don't speak a lot of Spanish. My parents didn't speak a lot at home. Um, but it's there, like I understand a lot of it, but so I'm like, well, how hard that could that be? Let's, let's do that. But I did not know there's 11 different ways to say drinking straws in Spanish. It depends oh on where you're from. That's a fun so, fact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. So yeah, Mexico is popotes, uh, sorbeto is here in Puerto Rico, asorbete in uh, Cuba. I mean, everyone has their paja, pajilla. I was like, oh my God. And then, you know, with Spanish, it ends up changing the whole structure of the of the sentence, right? Sure. Whether it's you know, with a, a feminine, whatever is it? What it was translation, it was really interesting. And but that was my first translation. I had these little flyers there. It was like two to an eight and a half thing, at eight and a half um, by eleven page, and I can get two flyers. And so I had them a uh, double sided, one side Spanish, one side English. And I just started putting it up um, in billboards and restaurants and stuff. And uh, just having people ask for no straw. And that's basically the ask I was asking, please consider asking for no straw. Um, but that was just, I was only coming here for small amounts of time and I wanted to be the crazy American. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but there was a lot of movement. Actually, there's a surf rider in, um, in Rincon that's really active. They oh, do a lot right. of water testing. And, uh, but their whole thing, they have, they have like risable plastics and stuff like that, but they're really big on, on water testing. And there was one of their, 
of volunteers from there, an expat as well, American surfer who started a, a straw campaign and I've connected with her and it's been great. And actually Straw's film came to the Puerto Rican Film Festival. Um, it was last year, well, 2019 and won, um, won an award for best documentary short film um, in Puerto Rico. So I kind of feel like it came full circle for me, like being here. Yeah. Um, but yeah. coming up though, what I'm really excited about, that's what you're trying to lead up to was Plastic Free July, right? Uh, and that, we're working with- And you had Latino. also mentioned, um, I feel like there was another event in, in yes. uh, July. Yeah. Uh, it was Latino, Latino Conservation Cons Week. Conservation Week, yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. So we're really excited about this and we're still like, I, I still don't have a link or anything to share. We're, we're still formulating it, but basically we had an idea. It was Melissa Aguayo from, um, uh, well, we're usually from Fry Jars now. She's with Break Free From Plastic. And then we got Marina from uh, Latino. Um, Green Latinos, Green Latinos. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got together and we had this idea about kind of reclaiming zero waste because it's part of our culture, right? Like anyone who's Spanish knows, like we, we joked around that Abuela is the original zero waster and that she could tell you how to, how to go zero waste and not, not some, you know, white millennial with all these like, you know, fancy water bottles and stuff. It's like, no, just bring your own damn cup or jar or whatever. And, and you know, our, our relatives have always repurposed everything. Um, and just kind of showing that resilience, but also kind of reclaiming it as a culture that this is part of our culture. You know, uh, even like uh, I have friends that are uh, from India and they talk about the tip, the stackable tiffins, you know, I forget what they call them, but here they call them fiambreras. They used to be able, that's how you would take, you know, the workers out in the fields. You would have these stacked um, containers and each of these They're containers They're stainless had, steel, right? And they fit together. Yeah, they yeah. fit together. Some of them were, um, I think, aluminum too but the stainless steel yeah and they would take them and you would have your your meal so that's coming back these reuse systems and everything but but it was it's this is all school um and so we're really excited about this we have latino we have plastic free july so we're kind of reclaiming plastic free july and, and we are just reached out to a lot of other um you know latino-based organizations and ask are you doing any for, anything for latino conservation week that we can cross promote you know, do, do we want to like just build on this theme of reclaiming zero waste? And it, it's been great. We're talking about TikTok videos. We're talking about all this stuff and, you know, hashtags. We're formulating all that now, but I, I could share uh, when that comes out, like you know, how you can follow, how you can tag, how you can participate, even like showing your zero waste um, ways right. that you're, you're doing it. So. And I love that yeah, mentality of the abuela, you know, like, so for those listening and don't know Spanish is like, what would your grandmother or great grandmother have used prior to the 1950s, um, and for the younger generation, they literally don't know, uh, yeah. but whether it's parchment paper or wax paper, or, you know, we used to wrap uh, the sandwiches in a cloth napkin with the chips, and when you got to the beach, you just open your napkin, and that was like your placemat. Um, mm -hmm. So going back a little bit to what did people do prior to having all these disposable plastics, and it was reusables, and you know, that mason jar, that glass mason jar, and you put your napkin and things in it, and it's all, you know, it's, so there's a lot of great alternatives. So um, I, I wanted to segue into action. You know, a lot of people are fired up. They hear about this. They're like, I don't want this plastic pollution in the marine environment, um, but they don't know what to do and don't know how to take action. And I'd like to hear um, some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, take it from me. It's it's like you know, act locally, go global. And so, a lot of what I think um, I learned and and actually can share and and actually makes me effective as um, an advocate against plastic pollution, I, I learn locally. You know, just you know your your you know your area better, your community better than I do. I might have like tools. That's the thing. When I started Last Plastic Straw, it was always open sourced. I had different tools I would share. You know um information and all kinds of, of tools that they can do outreach but you know the people you know who you need to contact you know you might have your favorite restaurant and i always tell kids it's like you know you have more power than you think your voice matters and um you know go to your local city council speak up uh you know show up stand up speak up whatever whatever it is that you're passionate about i mean we need it all and um and 
in whatever you're good at, like you're good at writing, you're good at art or whatever, however you want to, you know, communicate, but please just, you know, it, it, it's a lot just to show up and stand up and speak up is, is huge. So that's, I really encourage people to do that as you get involved and get action. But yeah, yeah there's a lot you can do on the local level, you know, state level, but also we are really excited that we just um, launched the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Uh, we launched it originally in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great for plastic pollution and it, it really does um, cover from wellhead to waste and really every every component of the of the bill is just basically the whole life cycle of plastic and how it pollutes all the many ways it pollutes um, our environment and, and, and how it's a systemic change in how we're dealing with it. You know, we're, we're one of the biggest exporters of plastic waste. What we call recycling is shipping it off to other countries. So this is really important. Other countries are looking to us to pass something like this to handle our own waste. You know, we have to clean our own house and um, right. and we're not, we're just passing the buck. So this is a really important legislation. I think at the end, we're gonna share a link that you can get involved in. I think Oceana has yeah. got a, a way that you can contact your local legislator. We're looking for more co-sponsors. Unfortunately, it's a it's a it's not a bipartisan bill. It's, it's very democratic right now. We don't have a Republican, um, but this is not a, um, a political or a, you know, a party bill. Honestly, this is what I mean. I think Republicans and Democrats should be, get behind, and these are pragmatic and practical solutions that have been proven on the local and state level to work. And yeah. so, what we're doing with this really is is just a baseline that would help the whole United States just kind of get a you know just give us a break with all this plastic and inundated. And I don't know know if most people know this, but I think also why a lot of people got involved and why I went from slacktivist to activist and saw so much more exponential, you know, plastic trash on the beaches is what I learned was that, you know, half of all the plastics that ever been made has been made in the last 15 years. And so that's why you're seeing crazy stuff and like just crazy uses of plastic, wasteful uses of plastic, like an avocado wrapped in plastic. Like, what is that? You know, those make me crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's like kind of mind blowing. Yeah. So all this was just kind of like this, just give us a break. Like this is just crazy. And there's been a, just a rapid um, just influx or, or just, I mean, like during the Trump administration, they were like handing out permits for uh, refineries and, and, and more of these, these cracking plants like crazy um, mm -hmm. to, to make even more plastic. And what these cracking plants do, it's a cracking ethanol from the, um, from our frac fracking boom. We have this excess of fracking gas, right? So this is yep. what they're betting on or they're going to make their money that they're going to make more plastic, but not even just plastic, but low grade crappy cheap plastic that they're going to yep. ship all around. So we want to just give a pause to that, that build out and, um, and really have an assessment on like environmental assessment, but also what does this do to communities? A lot of times we talk about what's happening at the waste end and the toxicity and the environment and people, or even when you're using something that's plastic to eat or drink out of, but what about the toxicity to the workers that are making this, the people that are working in these refineries, the people who are living near those refineries? That's right? a great point. Yeah. So that, that is kind of what this bill kind of creates. And then what that does is it, it wouldn't supersede any, um, any stronger bills that you might have on the local level. Cause, cause again, you know, everyone's waste system is different in how they deal with it or what their what their needs are. Some people have uh, more advanced or, or things that they're actually taking uh, people's home compost or whatever. So that this bill would just be the baseline and then you can build upon that in your community, I maybe mean, as a stronger yes. ordinance. So it's, it's, it's huge, it's great. It, it'll be, um, I, again, I think it's practical. I don't think there's nothing about it that's ambitious or whatever, it's just common sense. The, but industry will will say that it's it's not pragmatic as a uh, control, but it's it's not true. It's no, all it's, of everything that we have in there has been has been successful. It's been tried. It's been true, and it works. Yeah, and if the break really the break free to, from. Oh, go ahead. Process. Sorry. Well, if you really want to tackle the problem, there it is. You know. Yeah. So. That bill, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, really is, I think, the most comprehensive bill we've seen that mm -hmm. is on multiple pillars, like you said. So from extraction to production to distribution to, you know, uh, banning these pervasive items that we see all the time, uh, you know, to extended producer responsibility. It really kind of covers the whole thing. And Environmental justice, a huge component of that, too. Correct. Right. Yeah. 
it's all super important. And yeah. I think it's great to see uh, more education about, as you said, the environmental justice, what's happening at some of these incineration facilities and recycling facilities. It's not just throwing away that straw from your fancy restaurant. It's so much bigger than that. Yeah. Um, and now we're seeing it's tied to climate and also to public health. So like, um, just really excited. Oh, yeah, we no, hopefully we get support behind that. I want to hear, uh, we've got about five minutes left, okay. so I want to hear a little bit about Plastic Pollution Coalition and mm -hmm. then um, some final thoughts. But tell okay. me a little bit about what Plastic Pollution Co Coalition has been doing. So, well, they started in 2009, and um, basically it was, uh, I think, a group of about 25 organizations and individuals. I'm not sure what number was organizations, how much individuals, but I wasn't there at the beginning. There was four founders, and that the last one standing is Diana Cohen, is one of the co-founders, and then her sister, too, um, was Julia, uh, one of the ones that was kind of like a... Uh, a silent partner founder, but um, really kind of gave Diana, Diana the idea to to form a coalition because what had happened at the time, um, there was a lot of data coming out about plastic in the ocean, right? And so it was starting to be seen and quantified and people were starting to see it. So the plastics industry was like, oh yeah, we, well, we, we care. And so it was for the first time they did this marine debris conference, but they called it marine debris. And, um, and the reason they call it marine debris is that, you know, what happened was industry came, they wanted to reach across the aisle, like, we care, we, we want to do it. And they were, all the nonprofits like, yes, let's, let's work together, let's do this. But at the end result, what they did is they bought themselves a seat at the table. And so when it came time to make a statement or some sort of, uh, you know, commitment, I'm not even sure, I wasn't at that marine debris conference, but it was they would, they would not sign off on calling it what it was, plastic pollution. It was marine debris, sure. which could be a coconut. This marine right. debris, whatever it could be so um that's when a lot of the people that had been working on it said let's why don't we do something so the, one of the main goals was to just to uh kind of educate people on it to work together a lot of these organizations that work at the messaging the shared messaging and really call it what it is it's plastic pollution and that's what they they did in, in the name of it even but to have that be a part of the um just the the, the knowledge and the awareness around plastic and so it's kind of we really are kind of more of a communications organization we have all these organizations now we've got 1200 organizations in seven different countries i forget mm -hmm. all the stats but we are it, it is global um and we have a lot of businesses as well which is different too and we've got like i mean our founder likes to say it was a mind-blowing day when the teamsters and the girl scouts join them the same day so we have schools we have individuals we have community groups so it's just this whole mismatch and we just is sharing of information of a lot of the work that our coalition is doing uh, you know five jobs part of it, it you know, we work with Ochana, we work with a lot of organizations that are that are working towards um, eliminating serious plastic pollution from the source so but so now it's it's grown to that i was a member of them i was so proud when i my little last plastic straw when i was 2014 i applied to be a member as a as a um a coalition mm -hmm. member as a a an organization and i was just so stoked because what that did is that gave me access to all the other groups working on this and that really kind of opened my eyes and enabled for me to plant the seed with other groups working on this about the significance of plastic straws and how i felt that could really kind of help turn the tide and, and the get more people and that's a great example to your previous point about, you know, get involved with other groups, yeah. then you're learning and networking with people that are doing the work, and then we're sharing that forward and, and getting the broader message out. I've attended some of the Plastic Pollution Coalition webinars, and they're amazing, whether it's how plastics affect, affects pregnant women or human health or just yeah. a lot of fantastic speakers, um, and there is so much more time that we could fill speaking yeah. with you, but our time is coming to an end. So, I could literally talk to you about this for about five days. Um, so I'll just come to Puerto Rico and we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah let's do it. <laughs> um, but we want to make sure that uh, we share how people can find out more about you and the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to throw up on the screen uh, a slide that has a link to the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, and if you have any closing words while you're sharing sort of your final mm -hmm. thoughts, Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to put up a screen that will give people the opportunity to take action right now as they're watching this. Folks, if you see that QR code, you can um, aim your cell phone at that and scan that with your photo app. And that will take you direct to OCNA's petition to tell Congress to support the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. 
Jackie, why don't you uh, give us some closing thoughts and um, just been really great talking to you and I'm really appreciative of your time. Well, thank you, Nancy. It's been great. I, I really appreciate Oceana. And, you know, you know, you, you spoke about these webinars and they started as luncheons that we, uh, Oceana in DC was one of our hosts of these luncheons. And so we've had a great partnership with Oceana and we're so excited that, uh, you know, you guys are getting involved in plastics and it's just been, a, you guys have been great allies and, and great partners. And so thank you. I'm just so stoked to be working with you. And I mean, my last thoughts are just, you know, I, I just want to impart it, it, that plastic never was and never will be disposable. So we just need to think about that. And it never was made to be recycled. So no matter what comes out of the ether and what's being marketed to you, I really urge you to really kind of get to the truth of plastic and how much it's really needed. There's a lot of great needs for it, but there's a lot that's being wasted. And it's just plastic, the, the, the feedstock for plastic is the 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 toxic waste byproduct of the fossil fuel and gas industry. So just think about that. And so they've created a market with their toxic waste. And so essentially they're transferring off to, to us and our communities. So it is important to hold the um, manufacturers and the, the creators of this plastic accountable and everyone who uses it down the supply chain. And, and please get involved and please check out plasticpollutioncoalition.org. You can check out, like, like Nancy said, some of the past webinars have been incredible. We have a whole webinar on the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act where you can learn more about it. Um, I just did one on ethics of plastic. We had one with Plastics and Health and was, was incredible with Shauna Swan. Um, so just, yeah, and you can see past ones. So even the one that I just did yesterday, that will be brought up and you'll be able to see that one. And we have our next one is in July. I don't have the date at the top of my head, but it will be, if you even go to plastpollutioncoalition.org, it's gonna um, come up and you're gonna see when that is. But that's on on period plastic, on administration and plastics and um, administration products. So it's gonna be really interesting. So we try to keep it interesting and relevant and stuff that not only that our coalition people in, that are working in this field could gain something from, but also mass audience to really kind of um, elevate the the knowledge and, and just the interconnectedness of, of everything with uh, plastic and how that's affecting us and what we can do to change that. Awesome. And I almost forgot, but yeah. I need to remind everyone uh, thank you, okay. Jackie, so much to please catch the next Ocean Steward Spotlight on July 8th here on Facebook. We'll be speaking with Marilyn Hemingway. She's the president and CEO of the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce based in Georgetown, South Carolina. Marilyn's a leader in community activism and a strong voice for the Gullah community. Again, Jackie, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to connect with you again on future uh, plastic pollution um, efforts. And uh, it's just been really great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Oceana. It's been great.